Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing my review of Breakdown by Tat and Spiller. We're living through the breakdown, and here's what we can do about it. So this is a non-fiction book. It was sent to me for review. It was actually unsolicited, but man, they've got my taste down just right, because I looked at the blurb and was like, I have to read this thing. So I'm going to read that blurb out to you, and then I'm going to start going through and reading out um, some of the highlights from it. We're living through the breakdown, a time of enormous political upheaval, but many of us feel ill-equipped to understand and debate the issues currently rocking our world. Brexit, a chance to take back control or taking us to the brink of disaster. Immigration, a strain on our country or a crucial part of our economy. Austerity, essential reduction of national debt or devastating cuts to public spending. Tax cuts, control over your money or a threat to the welfare system. Privatisation, crucial efficiency boosting competition or the ruthless destruction of our public services. Ban on plastics, saving the planet or excessive government interference. At last, here is a sane voice of reason that cuts through the noise, that will give you all the tools to work out what's happening and why, so you can do something about it. So I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then at the end I'm going to give it my overall thoughts and a rating. Right at the start in the introduction, there's this fascinating bit on how um, the way that we consume news has changed, and so that's kind of led to an inherent fracturing of our beliefs, you know? So he says, In the deepest, darkest depths of history, there was once a time where most families had only one screen in their house. It was in a room where everyone would come together to fight about which of the three, four or five channels they would watch. This forced people into a situation in which they would have to compromise. Imagine the horror. One consequence of those days, though, was that people used to watch the news together. Possibly because Casualty had just finished and Match of the Day was yet to begin, but still, it happened. And when people watch the news together, it sparks conversation. Of course, nobody ever agrees with their parents, so sometimes those conversations would escalate into arguments. Your views on a particular news story might have been challenged. Maybe you would have changed your mind. Probably not. But at least you'd have heard the other side of the argument. And obviously, that contrasts with today where we all get our news separately from online from social media, you know, from the publications that we choose to follow because they confirm our existing biases. So this will be interesting to people who, um, you know, like to talk about things like cancel culture and also just the toxicity we see on social networking sites a lot. So he's talking about memes. Um, as I write, there is one doing the rounds on both sides of the divide. It shows someone's brain being replaced with dog poo and they then shout out some sort of ridiculous comment. Images like this are then shared hundreds, maybe thousands of times. The more you see this sort of thing, the harder it becomes to take that person seriously. Every time they open their mouth, you think of that absurd meme plastered across the internet. They are permanently marked down as stupid, uncaring, selfish. It's so easy and so cheap and so destructive. And every time we share a meme, picture or article that confirms our righteous decisions and opinions, we deepen that division. We create a narrative of them and us. We dehumanise the opposition. And we prevent any kind of meaningful debate. And he, and he says, All of which has led us to the breakdown. The breakdown in communication. The breakdown of understanding. The breakdown in trust. Which is what this book is all about. And he talks about how we can never agree on things and everything's so polarised, uh, particularly politically. So he says, Imagine trying to live your life this way. Imagine trying to plan a night in with friends. People who you've chosen to live with because you supposedly share a similar outlook on life. Picking out a takeaway in a series on Netflix. But rather than calmly discussing the options to work out what suits the taste of the wider group, you're hell-bent on stating your own slightly left-field preferences and refusing to listen to anyone else. At best, you end up a bit lonely, one of you stranded with pizza, the good place, and regret in one room, while it's a Chinese stranger things and floods of tears in another. At worst, nobody watches or eats anything. The room is set on fire. The building burns down. And who loses out? We all do. But especially the most vulnerable people in our society, the ones who need the government the most. Okay, so he talks about some different ideologies here and says... Um, basically compares them to, to uh, Christmas. And what's interesting is this make, would make me a socialist. So he says, liberals and libertarians. Liberals are all about freedom, plurality and diversity. That's exactly how they see Christmas, a festival of celebration, whether you're enjoying Christmas, Hanukkah or even Saturnalia. Liberals are, ha liberals are happy there are decent TV, presents, good food and the opportunity to chase your personal vision of happiness. Then socialists, so this is what I would be. Socialists aren't huge fans of religion. It is hierarchical and distracts from the human condition. That doesn't mean they don't like Christmas. They're all about the giving and the human kindness part and the strengthening of community bonds. Just don't expect a present from Amazon. Then we have conservatives. Conservatives love tradition and family. That makes Christmas Day pretty big for them. Church, turkey, no presents until after the Queen's speech. And then we have what I've never heard of really, I guess. One nation conservatives slash social democrats. This lot occupy the middle ground. They like traditions. In fact, anything done on Christmas Day could become a tradition that has to be stuck with for years. 
but are accepting of other people's customs as well. They're slightly uncomfortable with a rampant consumerism, but join in nevertheless. I just thought this was quite funny because he talks about veganism and I'm also vegan. Hashtag team vegan. Flexibility is another bonus for fans of the free market. With so few rules, things can change very quickly. I was vegan in the late 1990s when it was pretty niche. Soya milk was expensive and could only be bought in health food shops. There was one cafe in Soho that used to do soya cappuccinos. Now, veganism is much more widespread and so there is a huge variety of cheap soya milk readily available and sold in almost every cafe. The market for soya milk has completely changed. That's supply and demand right there. He talks here about the French motto as well, which I've been talking about recently because obviously I was learning French. Sort of am still, I don't know. So, um... It says, the, the French Revolution began not long after, in 1789. The next year, one of its leaders, Maximilien Robespierre, coined a phrase that would become synonymous with the revolution and that is still the national motto of France. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. That's freedom, equality and brotherhood. What comes first? Freedom. At the, at the time of the revolution, the phrase was also often followed by ou la mort, which means or death. Freedom or death. Um, but yeah, it's funny because it's fraternité and it could have also been sorority, you know? So this is talking about conservatism and what conservatism means in the UK and I just thought there was some interesting um, differences between conservatism in the UK and conservatism in the US. So conservatism believes very strongly that we are all different and that some of us are better than others which leads to a natural hierarchy and most importantly that's okay. At the top of the hierarchy in the UK we've got the Queen. This shows how varied conservatism can be. American conservatives, the Republicans, are passionate about not having a monarchy. Their name literally means people who don't want to be burdened by a king or queen. Conservatives in the UK, though, are really, really keen on the monarchy. They think it is a wonderful institution, full of history and significance, as well as a force for good in the world, helping to give the nation stability, shape and character. And let's be clear here, stability is the name of the game. Stability of community, of the markets and of politics. That's in stark contrast to socialism, or, more specifically, Marxism, which preaches revolution and sweeping change. Here's a statistic slash fact that I didn't know. If you're a white working class boy, you're less likely than anyone else in Britain to go to university, which I am a white working class boy, did go to uni. So I'm going to read this little bit here, which talks more about socialism. And again, I guess this is the closest to what, what I am. What socialists really value is equality. That's the thing they put front and centre. Everything else has to come after that. We're all people, we're all born equal, we should all be equal. Aha, I hear you say, equality. That's what liberals want too, isn't it? Those French revolutionaries, they wanted liberté, égalité, fraternité. The American Declaration of Independence was all about all men are created equal as well. Equality is definitely a liberal ideal. Yes, in a way. But socialists look around at this liberal world and see a rigged system. The whole idea of freedom and equality is nonsense. The notion that we can all be equally free to do what we want is a myth. For most people, the cards are stacked against them, and this is the only game in town. Do you remember all that stuff about the free market? How wonderful it is to be able to act in our own self-interests, make our own choices? How happy it makes liberals and conservatives for that matter? Well, socialists don't really agree. They hate the free market. A lot. My advice? Don't bring it up in a conversation with a socialist. It won't end well. They look at the free market and they cry foul. They point to the fact that if you happen to be particularly good at, say, banking, you will be paid inordinate amounts of money for your skills. If you're good at something else, let's say caring for other people, then you will be paid incredibly little for your time. It's not fair and it's not right. I think this is an important reminder here, again, especially with things like cancel culture. It's okay to disagree with people and just because you disagree with them doesn't make them evil. Once you accept that, it's possible to look at their actions and see them as positive steps towards their vision for the country. And he says that's why we should trust MPs. Okay, I'm going to give you another example here of some of the differences between the ideologies. Uh, so this is about straws, basically, and whether we should ban plastic straws. So liberals and libertarians. Straws are wrong, but we can trust in the free market to respond to the problem on its own. Look, in reaction to public opinion, many cafes and restaurants have already stopped using them voluntarily. No new rules needed. We can maintain our liberty. Socialists. Straws are wrong. They should be banned. Immediately. How can it be okay to keep using things we have decided are wrong? Sure, many cafes and restaurants have stopped, but have they all? And I kind of agree with that, except also I've heard a good argument. People with disabilities quite often need plastic straws. Uh, paper straws aren't as, um, you know, they're not as durable and they can dissolve. And um, then like metal straws are too inflexible and can ca cause injuries. So I don't know what the solution is there. Traditional conservatives. We've been using straws for a long time. We should make more of an effort to recycle and dispose of them properly. That way they won't end up in the seas and oceans. 
But really, it's not us causing the issue in the seas. China, Indonesia and the Philippines are the ones causing most of the damage. Cutting down on our use of straws would make no difference. And then we have... I hate people who think like that, by the way. One Nation Conservatives and Social Democrats. Straws are wrong. They pollute and use too many natural resources to create. Relying on the free market might not be enough to stop their use entirely. But we can't ban them now because companies and livelihoods are based on the plastic straw industry. We'll ban them in five to ten years' time, giving these companies the chance to prepare and reduce their reliance on straws. Which actually does sound like the most reasonable option of those lot. So if you're kind of interested in the state of the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, I thought this was quite interesting. Of course, there are people who want to charge for some NHS services. The NHS is in a bit of trouble, to be honest. The way the whole thing functions is through the working population paying enough taxes to cover healthcare for everyone. But our population is getting older. The number of retired people is getting higher and higher, leaving a smaller ratio of taxpayers covering the bill. The NHS is almost a victim of its own success too. People are treated more successfully so they stay alive for longer. The longer they stay alive, the more likely they are to require more NHS treatment. So this is more evidence to me that I think I might be a socialist. Um, because it's talking about um, free school meals for everybody and um, the idea of whether it should just be free school meals for people who can't afford it or free school, school meals for everyone, you know? While we're here, let's get off the bus for a minute and think about free school meals for all primary school children. It's a beautiful piece of ideological purity. Currently, only children and families on benefits receive a free school meal. Most of us would agree that children who don't have enough to eat at home should be given a free hot and nutritious meal at lunch. Really, that's something almost everyone in society can get behind. Children shouldn't be hungry. But Labour want everyone to have a free school meal, partly because they think that if some children are on free meals and some aren't, some kind of stigma could develop. One school I've worked in had two lunch queues, one for the free meals and the other for those who were paying. Now, that school had a very high percentage of students on free school meals, so there was no visible stigma in being in the queue for tickets. However, it's not hard to see that with the ratios a little different, it could be deeply damaging. It's also about community. It's the act of sitting down and breaking bread together. Physically, it ensures everyone has a decent meal, but spiritually it means we come together and are bonded by our shared experience. This is socialist gold. They love it. But it's true, like, there would be a stigma and, you know, I'd be worried that then you'd end up with kids not eating because they're too embarrassed to eat. I think when we talk about refugees, uh, I think as British people we tend to have this perception that we have a lot of the world's refugees here, when we, we don't really, so... Uh, According to the UK-based Refugee Council, there are over 68.5 million people around the globe that have had to flee their homes. In 2017, according to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UK was home to 121,837 refugees. Which isn't very many people at all, we have like 65 million people. So there's some more stuff about socialism here which I you know, thought was quite interesting. There are ideological reasons for the Labour Party to be more likely to support current levels of immigration. Socialism can be very internationalist. It promotes the idea that workers are equal regardless of nationality. During the Scottish independence referendum of 2014, the socialist politician George Galloway toured Scotland with a message that Scottish workers have more in common with the workers from the north of England than they do with the ruling class in Scotland. A pamphlet created for the tour said, Two and a half thousand years ago, Socrates declared that he was not an Athenian or a Greek, but a simple citizen of the world. Albert Einstein described nationalism as an illness, the measles of mankind. It sickens me that the country of my birth is threatened by such obsolescent dogma. Flags and borders do not matter a jot. So I thought this was quite balanced. Um, I'm, I don't know, you might disagree, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it out anyway. This book isn't about taking sides though, so it's important to look at the flip side of the feminism coin. We need to talk about menism. People who think men are being left behind, that men are struggling for equality. Menists find the constant promotion of feminism to be oppressive. The great fanfare, for example, of International Women's Day is always anathema to them. Sure, there is an International Men's Day too, but that just doesn't carry the same weight. Hang on, you might say, what could men possibly say was stacked against them? Let's have a quick look. 76% of suicides are men. 60,000 fewer boys than girls go to university every year. 85% of rough sleepers in the UK are men. It's not just the rough sleeping either. In 2018, of the 597 homeless people who died on the streets or in temporary accommodation, 501 of them, 84%, were men. Men are less likely to report their struggles, either mentally or physical. Men are more likely to be sent to prison, and for longer. Remember that protest group Fathers for Justice? Members used to wear superhero outfits and climbed on roofs of famous buildings. Their campaign says that courts don't give fathers enough access to children, that the automatic position is to give custody to the mother. 
The obvious comeback to this is that men rule the world and run the businesses, but the argument is that we're talking about a tiny proportion of men. The vast majority are the workers, who have been taught that boys don't cry and that they just have to get on with it. We were talking about domestic abuse earlier in this section, and yes, a third of domestic abuse is against men. But men don't like to report it because it feels a bit rubbish, possibly a bit weak, to admit that you're being abused by your female partner. There was, there was a mention here for a website called The Culture Trip, which I interviewed for once, didn't get the job, alas. There's a little section on Extinction Rebellion as well. Um, I'm going to read this all out because I think it's quite interesting. While all around were losing their heads about Brexit in 2019, one group stood out from the rest. Extinction Rebellion, or XR, were there to tell us that we are living in a climate emergency of our own making and we need to act now. They wanted the government to declare a climate emergency, to reduce emissions to net zero by 2025 and to create and be led by a citizens assembly. It's a tough gig. The Conservative government had already committed to being carbon neutral by 2050 and XR's demands simply aren't compatible with the Conservative vision. They're calling for radical change from those who believe in slow reform. But let's go back a bit. The first steps to XR were made in mid-2018 when over 100 clever and or influential people signed a document calling for action. The number is important because they've never had a leader. In their own words, XR is a participatory, decentralised and inclusive organisation, a principle that allows its members to act in their own way to achieve the XR demands. Sure, they don't have a single well-known figure to take the Good Morning Britain sofa to chat to Piers Morgan, but they raise media awareness in a different way. They first called people together in London on the 31st of October 2018 to hear their declaration of rebellion. Over a thousand people came and the movement was born right there on the streets that would become their home. They had clear demands, they had thousands of supporters, they had a government who they knew wouldn't listen. Conventional means weren't going to square that circle. Their solution? Get out on the streets in bright carnival clothing and make a fuss. They would be peaceful, but absolutely break the law. Disrupt, disobey. Yes, they were going to irritate some people, but they argue they're trying to save the world. XR haven't yet changed government policy. What they have done is raise consciousness and pressure. They have forced the issue of climate and governmental emergency at political, social, cultural and personal agendas, while encouraging individuals to take action. Like others in this section, the work of XR is ongoing. And then we finish this off with a, a se section called How It Works, which talks about basically the structure of the British political system. Yeah, I want to share some statistics here on, uh, on, uh, on the 2017 election. And this is basically all about proportional representation. Uh, basically, the way that it works in the UK is that you can get a shitload of votes and not have any MPs. So, um, so uh, from the 2017 election, the Conservatives needed 43,000 votes per MP. Labour needed 49,000 votes per MP. The SNP, the Scottish Nationalist Party, got 35 MPs on the back of fewer than a million votes. So that was 28,000 votes per MP, per MP. In Northern Ireland, the DUP got 10 MPs with 300,000 votes, 30,000 votes per MP. The Liberal Democrats got 12 MPs with 2.4 million votes, so that's 200,000 votes per MP. And then UKIP won nearly 600,000 votes and didn't get a single MP. Although, I don't really want them to have an MP, but I do want a fair system. So uh, this talks about the way that power is shared throughout the United Kingdom. Let's start by looking at the democratically elected institutions for three of the four countries that make up the UK. Here are the headlines. Scotland has its own parliament. Wales has its own assembly. Northern Ireland has its own assembly when they agree on enough to sit. In an attempt to make politics as complicated as possible, all these institutions have slightly different powers, but there are broad similarities. They all run their own education systems, which is why Scottish people don't pay tuition fees to go to university. Their own health systems, which is why all three countries now have free prescriptions, while it costs £9 prescription in England. And they also have the final say on elections to their institutions, which is why young people in Scotland are able to vote from the age of 16. And then it ends on this bit, which pretty much sums it all up. Um, so for you Americans and people who aren't British, we have like a national obs obsession with bins and when our bins are going to be collected. So he writes here uh, on the subject of councils. Your local council is responsible for a lot of what goes on in your area. Libraries, roads, tourism, school provision, parking, buses, parks, social care, planning, etc. But the thing that people seem to focus on most is rubbish collection. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We've gone through how this whole UK politics thing works. We've looked at some pretty big questions. Who can start a war? How can we change the law? What powers do cabinet members have? It isn't, it isn't until now though that we reach the single biggest issue in politics. This is what I hear about across the country when I talk to school students, adults, everyone. What do people really care about? Bins. People care about bins an awful lot. I like talking about bins too. Bins are a great topic because everyone wants regular bin collections. 
But money is tight, and the council will also say that less frequent bin collections encourage people to recycle more. The money, though, gets right to the heart of politics. There is a limited pot of cash in a long to-do list, so what do you prioritise? Bin collections, social care, parking? These decisions are hard. How do we decide what's most important to us? By voting. Candidates say what they'll do, we look at their different solutions and vote for the one that we like the most. So when we're talking about bins, we're actually talking about democracy. And that's pretty great. So all in all, I did really enjoy this book. The only thing I would say is that occasionally, like, the author's humour got a little bit distracting because it just sort of bulked things out a bit at times, you know? When he could have been more to the point by talking about things more directly without making the jokes. But um, it did also help to keep it all interesting. And it is by far the most interesting thing that I've ever read about politics, I would say. So yeah, I gave it a 4.5 out of 5 and it'll probably be in my top 10 of the quarter. So there we have it, that's what I thought about the breakdown by Tat and Spiller. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.